Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NOCO webinar, Traffic Analysis Toolbox, Volume 3, Update Proof of Concept Case Studies. My name is Matt Jasnos, and I'll help facilitate today's webinar. As a quick reminder, at the National Operations Center of Excellence, we offer a variety of resources to support the transportation systems management and, <clears throat> and operations community. You can go to NOCO's web, website, transportationops.org, to browse through links and TISMO resor resources and news. Previous webinars and recordings and case studies can be accessed from there. Now I'll cover a few logistics for today's webinar. We are recording this webinar and the recording will be available on NOCO's website, if you, uh, uh, usually in two to three business days after today's recording. All the attendees are encouraged to stay engaged by using the Q&A feature for questions and chat feature for comments these for both on the, the bottom of your screen. We have a questions and answer session at the end of the presentation. So you have, if you have any questions, we encourage you to answer them on the Q and A area as they come to you in a, uh, any mind during the, uh, at any time. Also, please feel free to enter your name and agency at the chat and say hello uh, to your peers. Now I'm gonna hand it over to our first speaker today, uh, James Coiler, James. Yes, uh, thank you, and thanks to NOCO for uh, <clears throat> hosting today's webinar. Uh, very appreciated. So, um, happy Halloween, everyone. Um, I'm James Collier, Federal Highway Administration Office of Operations, and um, I work on our traffic analysis tools program. Uh, <clears throat> dressed up like an engineer today. I think it's the best costume, but my kids think it's the worst costume. So. Uh, I'll let you decide. But um, anyway, um, we're going to present today on a project we've been working on for the last um, couple of years now. And um, why don't you go ahead, Matt, and um, and slide. Okay, I see the disclaimer slide. Hopefully, everyone else does as well. Um, this is the fine print all the way here. So um, just just to let you know we're. Um, um, not necessarily endorsing any products or manufacturers we may mention today, and um, uh, uh, and also um, that um, this is just providing information, not necessarily doing anything that would uh, have the force and effect of, of the law. Okay, so let's go to the next slide now. Uh, I'll go ahead and cover this slide here. So some background, the uh, FHWA's Traffic Analysis Toolbox. Um, hopefully some of you have heard of it before. Um, it's become, it's been around for uh, 20 years now. Um, uh, there's many uh, volumes to the toolbox. I think we're up to over 15 volumes in it. Um, what, uh, please, if you haven't um, seen it, please go to our, our website, um, the HWA Traffic Analysis Toolbox. Um, but one of the, one of the, the toolbox volumes, volume three, um, applies specifically to um, guidance on micro simulation software. And that, that one in particular has gotten a lot of use and um, attribution over the years from, from agencies and consultants doing simulation studies. Um, a couple of years ago, an expert panel recommend that, recommended that we um, revisit the, the guidance in that, that tool in that toolbox volume on simulation guidelines. And um, since a lot of things that kind of um, a change over the years, a lot of advancements in simulation technology, emerging data sets. And also there was um, there was a fair amount of subjectivity with the calibration criteria, for example, in, in the guidance. And so um, the, the expert panel recommended that we that we re revisit um, volume three and how can we modernize it. So that, that led to a project um, that started a few years ago uh, and uh, we hired uh, David Lidos and his team, who, who will, um, the three uh, key contributors will be talking later today. Um, and so that started us on a journey of updating um, uh, our volume three and, and also doing these case studies, which is the feature of today's webinar. Uh, so I think we've lost slides here, Matt, um, but if you got it, I'm on slide four now project motivation and goals. So the motivation of our project, there we go. Um, 
that we're talking about today is is um, when the volume three update came out a few years ago in 2019, there was there was a fair amount of, um, um, I guess, um, questions about its application and maybe if there are still today. Um, so we really wanted to do these real world case studies as part of this project to help um, <clears throat> maybe understand better what what are the the barriers and challenges and how can how can agencies and and, and analysts get get over or around these um, these challenges and um, and and find ways to actually adopt the 2019 method and so um, that's kind of the goal of, of this case studies project um, demonstrating the feasibility of, of in, in implementing the 2019 method. And then for it to be showcased and demonstration um, of, of how uh, of how the 2019 method could be applied to various um, settings and scenarios. Uh, so go ahead, Matt. We'll go to the next slide here. Uh, I think at this point, I'm, I think the plan is to hand it over to you, David, and um, talk a little bit more about um, uh, the case studies that we got into. All right, thanks a lot, James. All right, so this slide uh, shows an example of uh, cluster analysis output from the 2019 uh, Traffic Analysis Toolbox Volume 3 method. So the results here show that each cluster exhibits substantially different uh, traffic network performance. So ideally, uh, the TISMO strategy should allow for reliable travel times throughout the year under all operating conditions. Uh, so when you consider the data, the data shown in this table, you can start to envision how misleading a micro simulation project might be if it only focused on one set of so-called typical conditions or even trying to design for the 85th percentile conditions. Instead, only by explicitly developing and calibrating each of the models shown here would it be possible to assess the annual performance of uh, different alternatives under consideration. Uh, and when it comes to reporting the annual benefits of a certain alternative, uh, TAT Volume 3 suggests including all clusters in that calculation including what appear what might appear on the surface to be the low priority clusters or minimally congested clusters or low probability clusters. Uh, so for a robust analysis, it's safest just to include in, and consider all the clusters. So again, the project pertained to case studies uh, intended to show the benefits of the, the TAT Volume 3, uh, the 2019 method. And so the case study project included deliverables such as uh, a case study selection memo to try to identify the most pertinent three uh, real world case studies from across the country. Uh, secondly, a case studies report that uh, will hopefully be published uh, within the next several months. Uh, thirdly, we have uh, today's uh, national webinar is one of the deliverables of the case studies project. And fourthly, there's a series of three conference presentations uh, as, as part of the um, deliverables as well. And the final deliverable is a white paper on future recommendations related to improving uh, the information available for TAT Volume 3 and uh, announcing um, uh, different opportunities for using it in, in various um, uh, venues and, and mechanisms and, and how to uh, potentially improve the methodology uh, in the long-term future. Thank you, all right. So this slide here shows the seven-step micro-simulation analysis project, uh, uh, micro-simulation analysis process that was originally published in 2004 before being updated in 2019. And so although the slide implies that the biggest changes in the 2019 method pertain to model development, calibration, and alternatives analysis, uh, the step two data collection and analysis step also features significant changes because that's where cluster analysis now occurs. And so now, now Matt, I think we can advance to slide number eight. All right, excellent. So the upcoming uh, case studies report will contain the, the seven chapters listed on this slide. So notably chapters three through five each focus on a singular case study, which we'll be hearing about uh, in today's webinar, uh, whereas chapter six documents the findings of some uh, extra research experiments that didn't exist in the original scope of work. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, the research team originally considered a pool of more than a dozen candidate microsimulation case studies from real world locations. The goal was to select three final case studies whose published results could complement each other and provide maximum insights. So to achieve this, the final case studies would need to feature a healthy variety of alternatives to analyze, different operating conditions, different microsimulation tools, and so on. 
And there were also prerequisites for high quality case studies. Uh, and those prerequisites included uh, access to rich data sources, support of local agencies, and pre-existing uh, microsimulation models. Next slide, please. So to discuss the details of the first case study from Florida, I'm gonna hand off to Dr. Mohamed Hadi. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, as David said, um, we uh, this project selected three case studies and Florida um, is one of the three. Um, the corridor that or the uh, network that we selected uh, for the case study is um, yeah, I'm trying to start my video. Yeah. Okay, uh, so the network is uh, in South Florida in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Palm Beach area, and it includes uh, uh, an interchange that between uh, two freeways, a system interchange between the Sawgrass Expressway and the Florida Turnpike. Uh, it uh, has around uh, six miles on both uh, facilities. And uh, the main issue with that uh, interchange is in both the morning peak and the afternoon peak, there is a weave area uh, uh, for the northbound on and off ramp from the Sawgrass and Expressway and to the Sawgrass Expressway from the Florida Turnpike. Um, that uh, weave area uh, back up uh, in different days differently. Uh, and uh, if we are going to do the analysis, uh, assuming that this backup happened in the whole year uh, and activate uh, TISMO strategies or geometric design strategies, as David said, we we're going to be biasing the results because Several of the in the off season, which is in in Florida in the summer, and other days uh, we have less um, less congestion. Um, so we got data from uh, tools, uh, toll readers, uh, and data station and fixed sensors, and uh, uh, we uh, then analyze the system uh, using uh, a commercially available software. Next slide. Uh, so uh, again, um, we look at the, through the whole year, we want to look at the congestion variation and the benefit from applying uh, uh, alternatives uh, using the methodology, uh, tight volume three methodology. The key performance measures are uh, travel times on the main line and the on ramp, which both of them back up due to the weave area and uh, the bottleneck uh, throughput uh, at both the ramp and the uh, freeway uh, main line. We use three hours afternoon peak period. Uh, obviously, if it was a real world project, we would have done this also for the other peak, especially the morning peak. And uh, that is because the same similar backup, backup happened in the morning peak. Uh, the analytical approach, uh, we analyze uh, both weekdays and weekend data uh, across the two critical routes, the ramp and the main line. Uh, we use heat maps, uh, fundamental, uh, uh, obviously we simulate the whole network, the six miles uh, on the sawgrass and the six miles on the, uh, Turnpike, but the focus uh, in terms of uh, the analysis, obviously, and, and uh, the reporting the results was the for the ramp and the main line. Um, we use uh, visualization tools, which were very helpful for us when we look at the data. Uh, we use heat maps, fundamental diagrams, community community density functions, and that uh, com uh, in addition to the uh, fundamental diagram, which the speed flow relationship and analysis of traffic patterns and travel time reliability gave us a, a good idea even before we start the clustering about what is going on with the network and what are the, the uh, 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 situation uh, and, and scenarios. Next slide. Uh, so the data we have is volume and speed uh, from uh, microwave uh, traffic detectors. Uh, and uh, a detection station and also volume from toll tags. And fortunately we have the few locations where 
the toll tag uh, readers are in the same location as the count station. So we were able to confirm that the quant count station are able to provide uh, similar results to confirm the accuracy of the two sources confirming each other uh, that way. Uh, travel time, we got it uh, based on uh, the RITIS uh, data archive, which is mainly uh, fr from a third party vendor um, and of travel time. And then we got uh, rain data from the National Weather Service and uh, we got incident data from the FDOT uh, uh, incident and crash database. Next slide. Uh, so we identify, uh, when we run the simulation uh, or the cluster analysis, uh, we found out there are four clusters. Um, two clusters were light uh, or, or very low congestion. Uh, one of them represents the weekend and one of them represent uh, the mainly represent the weekend it seems and the other one represent weekdays with low traffic uh, or, and uh, low, low, uh, uh, that, that's low travel uh, low travel time low traffic volume and let, that's low travel time uh, uh, the cluster two and four they differ in uh, mainly in the in the period of congestion. So cluster two has congestion uh, for three hours of the peak. It starts uh, like 3.30 and continue until 6.30 or so on. While, uh, while uh, uh, the other uh, cluster uh, has congestion for 30 minutes or 45 minutes um, around the 5 p.m. Uh, peak period. Uh, so obviously these different clusters have different implications and the alternatives that we're going to evaluate, especially if they are TISMO alternatives, will have different benefits, different uh, strategies and so on. Next slide. Uh, so uh, we found out that uh, the resulting clusters did not uh, cluster the incident and, and weather events in a separate cluster. And uh, we uh, think that uh, a lot of this because there are um, a lot of the incidents in that location are shoulder incidents, uh, not many severe incidents. Also in Florida, most train events happen in the summer uh, that correspond to the off season. Uh, so we, uh, which is, which has less uh, less traffic. The, again, the clustering, uh, we because of the issue with the data, we have only 365 day, uh, uh, 294 days of the 365 that we isolated out the 365 days. And you can see the numbers. So the two congested cluster, the one with three hours of congestion is cluster uh, number two with 40 days. And the cluster with a shorter uh, period around the 5 p.m., around 45 to one hour is the one uh, is cluster four with 104 days. Um, next next slide. Uh, so if you look at uh, this table, it show you the travel time uh, and uh, you could see that cluster four again, uh, both the average and the maximum are high. Cluster two, I mean, both the average and maximum of the travel time are high while cluster four, you have the average uh, is low, uh, relatively low, and and the uh, maximum is uh, relatively high because of the congestion and the uh, and the thirty minutes to one one hour during the day. The other two clusters, both the average and the maximum, are uh, similar to similar, and they present the free flow condition for cluster one and three. Next slide. So uh, an important uh, step in the mo uh, volume three, which is different from <coughs> the current uh, methodologies, uh, in addition to clustering, which is an important uh, concept in, uh, in the methodology, another uh, difference uh, than uh, state uh, guidance and volume four, four methodology is the 
calibration based on the presentative day and based on new criteria. So you could see here that the presentative day should fall between uh, uh, the, this is uh, basically a representative day and uh, showing the one sigma, one standard deviation and the two sigma. Next slide. Uh, the, yeah. So no, the previous, uh, yes, this one. So basically we these four criteria um, are different from volume four, which uh, some uh, are familiar with uh, in terms of percentage error and so on. This one uh, is uh, ensure that uh, the simulation results, which are the uh, purple dots, uh, fall uh, within um, uh, uh, seventy-five, the one sigma and two sigma, with a certain amount uh, 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 from the representative day. So, ninety-five percent should be within the two sigma, and sixty-seven percent should be within the one sigma from the presentative day. There are two other ones, uh, two other uh, criteria um, uh, that has uh, volume three present equation for. One of them ensure that the error is lower than uh, for the representative day than all uh, the days. And also the other one, the fourth one, ensure that we are not consistently underestimating or consistently overestimating uh, the uh, performance uh, on all uh, periods in the peak of uh, compared to the representative day. Next slide. Uh, so um, the when we look at the model that was already calibrated based on uh, the state agency uh, criteria, uh, we found out that uh, we needed to refine it uh, and uh, fine tune it. Uh, so we changed the car following and lane changing model and we use the FDOT guidance of the ranges of those uh, uh, Weizmann, uh, uh, Weizmann 99 uh, car following and, and the lane changing model. Um, and we study uh, the congested clusters two and four. Uh, volume three recommend analyzing all the clusters uh, and we recommend that uh, to be done. Uh, but for this demonstration, we only analyze cluster two and four and we justify that uh, by, by the other being light. But for real world situation, that it is a decision that the, the, uh, has to be made carefully and, and uh, the preference is to make the analysis for all clusters. Next slide. So you can see that also the volume three presented a new methodology for to calculate the number of runs. Uh, we always use uh, obviously the T distribution if you are familiar with that equation uh, to calculate the number. We, we're still using the T uh, uh, student uh, distribution uh, uh, to uh, equation this, uh, for the analysis, but we have uh, a variation of it. Uh, in terms of calculating the tolerance and so on. Uh, but in any event, uh, the recommendation is to calculate the number required number of frames runs based for each scenario and for each route, and then select the maximum number of runs that are needed. In this case, uh, 13 runs were needed for one of the scenario for one of the routes, and uh, that's what we uh, run the model for. Next slide. Oh, before we do that, uh, I think that we assessed two alternatives. One of them is to deploy ramp metering, and one of them is to move the off-ramp uh, downstream uh, from the weave area. The, uh, sorry, the move the on-ramp downstream from the uh, weave area to eliminate uh, to eliminate the weave area. And uh, uh, the, uh, obviously this, this solution is expensive. It's uh, um, very high cost. Uh, there is an estimate for that cost, millions of dollars. And, and then the other ramp metering is uh, low, low cost alternative uh, that can be done um, uh, much more uh, easy, easier. So next slide. Based on this, uh, we uh, uh, did the evaluation both based on percentage change, but also using hypothesis testing 
as recommended in uh, in volume three, statistical hypothesis testing uh, uh, using also the t distribution. So if you look at the results, we we see that uh, alternative with uh, relocating the ramp, obviously it gives very high uh, improvement for the ramp, uh, minus nine uh, percent, and for the main line, minus seventy two percent reduction in uh, in travel time, uh, while uh, for the ramp metering, it increased the, obviously this was, uh, you know, not uh, totally optimized ramp metering. We use the Alenia algorithm that is built in the tool and we fine tune it a little bit. Uh, so the in this case, uh, we got 27% um, reduction, uh, increase in the ramp uh and uh table time and nine percent decrease in the in the main line uh, with the ramp metering but there are opportunities obviously to modify the geometry in combination with the ramp metering and and do other uh techniques to optimize the ramp metering uh strategies and then we could use this uh, to do the benefit cost analysis because then you know that we have 40 days with cluster four and and uh, one hundred four days with cluster uh, forty days with cluster two and one hundred four days with cluster four, so you could do benefit cost analysis this way. So I think this is my last slide. Uh, is that right? Um, yes, and I pass it to Paul. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Mohammed. Um, greetings, everyone. My name is Paul Morris. I'm with SRF Consulting Group, uh, located in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For those that are interested, uh, it's snowing pretty good outside here in Minneapolis right now. So uh, happy Halloween, I guess you might say. Uh, we're excited to share our presentation today about um, the case study in Minnesota. Uh, we did look at several different uh, potential case studies here and ultimately selected the one that was along uh, US Highway 10. This uh, was expected to be a very interesting uh, example for a case study because it's right at the location on the fringe of the urbanized area where Highway 10 transitions from a freeway in the urban area to a signalized expressway uh, further to the west. You can see that where the uh, illustrated where the blue turns into red. And I think there was interest in testing this methodology not only on freeway facilities, uh, but also uh, interrupted flow type facilities. So the first step in the process is the planning and scoping here. Um, as I noted, this is kind of in the northwest uh, portion of the metro area. And so the predominant flows are eastbound or coming into the metro in the morning and then westbound in the afternoon. And because those signals are on the western portion of the corridor, our focus was going to be on the afternoon peak period uh, during the commute home from work. One of the other interesting characteristics of this corridor is that it also serves as a gateway from the Twin Cities metro area to greater Minnesota, where a lot of um, metro area residents go on the weekends and during the summertime for recreational activities like camping, fishing, uh, et cetera. And so we knew that uh, some of the operational issues that this corridor experienced were due to that recreational travel and not just the traditional uh, weekday peak periods here. And so we did wanna make sure we were taking that into account and the uh, volume three methodology actually uh, works very well as a way to, to incorporate that into the analysis. So step two uh, really gets into the data collection. Uh, we're very fortunate in this region that we're in a, a, a data rich environment. Uh, through the freeway portion of the corridor, there are loop detectors embedded in the pavement uh, roughly every half mile. And so that gives us a, a very deep uh, supply of, of data providing uh, estimates of speed and uh, very detailed information on volume or flow. Uh, and we were also able to collect data in a number of other categories, including weather, uh, travel times from the NPM RDS. And we worked with partners at the local traffic management center 
to get information about uh, crashes and incidents uh, that had occurred during the time period. And I should also note, 29, the entire year of 2019 uh, was the data collection time period, and we were able to obtain data for all 365 days. So the next step in the calibration or the data collection process is the clustering here. And so following the guidance in the analysis, uh, cluster sizes from three, a minimum of three up to 27 clusters were analyzed. And uh, this was done using uh, a Python script. Um, obviously this is a big data analysis and so some uh, additional analytical power was needed there. And so each of the dots represents the goodness of fit parameter, which in this case is labeled as inertia against the number of clusters. The dot, the dashed line that passes through all those points is the fit. So you can see it does uh, generally decrease um, as additional clusters are added, meaning that um, each, uh, each day or observation um, you know, it is more closely related to the cluster that it is assigned to. However, what really stuck out, out to us is that clusters four, five, and eight uh, really were outperforming the rest. And so you can see those ones with stars on them fall below that trend line, suggesting that they sort of outperform what we would expect uh, just based on the, the general reduction. And so we looked into those in more detail and using the methodology in the guidance, which I should note, uh, I strongly recommend uh, printing that out. Um, that became my best friend uh, while we were conducting this work and uh, extremely helpful to refer to that. Determined that the, the five cluster model uh, provided the best trade-offs because part of what the guidance recognizes is that you're trying to optimize not just the fit, of all the observations and the clusters that they belong to, but also recognizing that additional clusters comes with additional cost in terms of uh, the model variants that, that have to be developed. And so you're trying to find the balance between uh, that goodness of fit and the number of clusters. So the next step as we move into model calibration is to identify the representative days. So while we have these clusters that represent five typical conditions or, or frequent, can frequently occurring conditions throughout the year, we still need to select an individual day so that the model be, can be calibrated to those specific conditions. So you can see that the specific dates in 2019 uh, that were identified as uh, the best representation of each of those clusters is shown there. And uh, I will say it was important to us to confirm that the those days met the characteristics of the cluster. Now, while the, the cluster you know is identified mathematically, it doesn't necessarily um, you know have to meet those characteristics. Uh, these were the general themes that we observed, and so we wanted to make sure, for example, that on December thirtieth there was actually snow, and we were able to confirm that there was. Obviously, that's uh, right in the middle of the winter. Um, Similarly, uh, the other days uh, in clusters one and two, June 27th and March 4th are both weekdays and November 16th was a weekend. Um, we were a little surprised uh, that in cluster four was on February 15th. We probably would have guessed that that was a Friday afternoon in the summer when a lot of folks are heading to their uh, summer cabins uh, or camping. Uh, but it turns out that February 15th was actually the Friday before uh, President's Day weekend. And so that also represents kind of that uh, recreational peak when a lot of uh, people travel away from the metro for um, holidays. So now that we know what those representative days are, we're able to compute the uh, what we call the variation envelopes for each of the clusters. And so this is just one example from cluster four, but there are similar graphics uh, for each of the clusters. Basically, the uh, line with the triangles in it represents the actual observations from the representative day. And then the one and two standard deviation bands are traced out above and below those lines. And so it's very important to be able to see that 
because it's critical to follow the steps in the guidance and uh, meet the calibration. On the next slide, we've overlaid the outcomes of the calibrated model onto that. And so a couple of key things that we can see, uh, we were fortunate in this case that the simulated output fell uh, not only within the two standard deviation band, but in most cases within the one standard deviation band. Um, and so it's very helpful to visualize this just to see kind of where uh, those model results are relative uh, to those uh, calibration envelopes. However, to actually complete the, the calibration process as prescribed in the guidance, it's not just a visual review of those graphs. And in, in fact, I think that is what the 2019 update was trying to get away from in many ways to make it really more of a statistical review. And so for those that have read the guidance, and I again encourage you to do that, uh, there are four criteria that establish a, a properly calibrated model. And while, you know, uh, there are some, you know, some sizable equations, let's say, in the guidance uh, underpinning each of those four criteria, um, you know, once we understood those and uh, plugged them into some spreadsheets, it actually became very efficient to complete the calibration here. The other thing that I would just say that we like about this is while some of the previous methodology, either in the, the previous uh, traffic analysis tools guidance, or some of the procedures used by individual state DOTs uh, does leave room for some subjectivity uh, in the calibration process. Um, we think it's it's extremely positive that this guidance has, has pretty black and white um, uh, criteria so that once, that, once those uh, thresholds are met uh, and the calibration is achieved, everyone can agree uh, that the calibration process is, has been satisfied and can move on to the next steps of the modeling. Okay, so the final step I wanna to touch on here today is the alternatives analysis. I think uh, we're, we're likely all familiar with this as part of the project development process. But again, sticking with the theme, the 2019 guidance uh, brings more statistical rigor into that process. The particular project that we were analyzing, um, which is now under construction, was to um, invest in grade separated interchanges where signals are currently located, um, as those were found to be primarily responsible for the congestion that was observed. However, we, we added a few more alternatives here just for the purposes of this demonstration. So we also explored a signal timing optimization that would not require capital investment as well as an auxiliary lanes option that would supplement that um, interchange alternative. One of the other steps that is part of uh, the alternatives analysis process in the guidance is to determine the number of iterations or runs that's required for each of the model variants and each of the alternatives. And uh, we actually found this to be a very interesting result and but fortunately, it was also intuitive that the most congested clusters, which include one, two, and four, under the most congested alternatives, namely the do nothing and signal timing optimization, required the maximum number of 20 iterations. However, under the other clusters that were less congested or the build alternatives uh, that essentially resolved all the congestion issues, the minimum number of four iterations was identified. And so, again, we thought this was a, an interesting exercise, both to demonstrate the, the, the guidance, but also that it, that it makes intuitive sense that uh, highly congested uh, facilities are highly variable. And so it requires a lot of uh, iterations of a model in order to achieve some convergence. Whereas when it's really uh, uncongested, uh, the model results tend to be very consistent from one iteration to another. And so last thing I'll touch on here is just the results of our alternatives analysis. Um, as Mohammed described just a few minutes ago, this does bring in a statistical hypothesis testing methodology. And so while that might sound you know, a little uh, intimidating for us as engineers or planners rather than uh, scientists here, um, I can assure you, you know, it's, it's very logical and the math really is, not, um, is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, but again, the, the other thing that it does do is I think it puts the context, puts the 
results of the models into context of whether they're meaningful and whether they um, you know, are, are significant at a statistical level here. And so just to highlight a few of the examples here, uh, looking across a couple of different um, alternatives that when we compared the do nothing and the signal optimization alternatives, while there were some benefits in terms of travel time, um, it was not found to be statistically significant. And so we're rejecting that um, hypothesis here. Whereas with the um, interchanges, that was you know, highly significant compared to the um, do nothing or, or signal timing alternatives. And so I think this is something we all intuitively know looking at the model results, but now we have some statistical rigor to back that up. And I think can use that as, as you know, even stronger evidence as we're working with uh, local partners or, or regulators to, to all have a shared understanding of the differences amongst the alternatives. So thank you for the opportunity to share our case study here today. I'll turn it over to Brock now to talk about Colorado. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, good afternoon, East Coast folks, and good morning for the West Coast. My name is Brock Cheshme. I'm at Kittleson in our Boston office, and I'll be uh, presenting some of the key findings from the third case study, which is from Colorado C470 corridor. And because Mohammed and Paul already did a pretty good job explaining the steps, I'm going to speed up a little bit just so hopefully, you know, um, participants will have some time to ask questions at the end. Um, so again, as I mentioned, um, our third city was from Colorado, um, the C470 corridor, which we looked into a freeway with several interchanges. And we worked pretty closely with Colorado DOT, especially when we were um, obtaining data. Um, on the corridor. So there were a few reasons for selecting this corridor as part of one of our case studies. Um, first, the corridor had relatively good data, and I, I'm intentionally saying relatively because as Paul mentioned, maybe we were not as much data rich um, in terms of some of the data, but still it was good enough for us to be able to test the 2019 methods. Uh, additionally, the corridor experienced uh, diverse travel conditions, uh, not just peak hour recurring congestion, but also weather-related congestion, congestion due to crashes, and et cetera. Uh, and lastly, we conducted the analysis using a different microsimulation software tool that was used uh, in the, uh, that was different from the first two case studies. Next slide, please. So in terms of the planning, step one planning and scoping, the, the uh, objective of the study was to develop alternatives uh, that can reduce congestion, that can improve operational performance and, and, and uh, address future transportation needs. Um, for the proof of concept demonstration, we selected key performance measures, including quarter travel times and um, continuous count station flows that, um, uh, that was available to us. Uh, just in terms of a little bit of the context, the corridor was roughly 15 miles. Um, we focused on the morning peak. Um, you know, just because we recognize that there were those diverse conditions that I mentioned earlier in the morning peak, and uh, we thought it was sufficient uh, to serve as a proof of concepts. Uh, and the corridor inclu included nine key inter interchanges and 13 ramp terminis uh, with signalized intersections. Next slide, please. Um, so step two, uh, which was the data collection and, and analysis, uh, we did collect similar to other cases that the teams various type of data um, obviously, things like geometry data to be able to develop the model, signal timing data, incident data, we worked. Uh, we were able to get from, from Colorado DOT. Uh, we had weather stations that are relatively close by that we were able to get the weather data. Um, we also, similar to what, what other teams did, um, were able to obtain travel time data from uh, probe vehicles as well as continuous count station data. Uh, next slide, please. So after data collection and data cleaning, we uh, basically prepared our data to be able to use as an input for the cluster analysis and um, applied the elbow methods uh, in k-means clustering. Um, so based on the results of the cluster analysis, even though it's not exactly very clear, you can kind of see the elbow shape that's happening around five. Um, and we are also we also did similar to what what Paul mentioned, uh, additional analysis looking into. Um, you know, different types of clusters and, and also creating those visualizations that Mohammed mentioned as well to be able to sort of figure out if that's, um, you know, elbow shape, shape occurring at five uh, generally makes sense. And we ended up selecting five clusters for this case study as well. Um, 
Uh, similar to the, the, the Florida DOT case study, um, you know, we thought visualizations related to travel characteristics are important and they can help understand system performance. And that's, that's what you see on the right side of the slides, uh, which is basically the fundamental diagram. You can see the sp speed on the vertical axis and the flow on the horizontal axis in vehicles per hour per lane. Uh, and the five clusters that we were able to come up with. A couple of things that I just want to highlight real quick here. Um, sort of, if, hopefully you can visually see that the low of demand cluster, which is shown in gray on the top left, sort of of the figure, uh, as you can expect, it's the low of demand cluster. Uh, it's happening in the free flow regime uh, in the fundamental diagram. Then when we move on to the more congested regimes, you can see first the low congestion scenario, which is shown in orange. And then, and I guess when we say low congestion, please keep in mind, these are not free flow. There's a little bit of congestion, but it's not resulting in uh, breakdowns. Um, and then we have the recurring congestion, um, which is shown in blue. Uh, and finally, you know, after the breakdown happens, you can see um, the, the purple one, cluster number four, which is the crash related congestion. And probably the, the most important thing from the, the methods perspective was, um, if you look at, if someone simply models the recurring congestion, which is shown in, in cluster zero blue, that roughly corresponds to 35% of, of, of the entire year. Um, so therefore, therefore, it's important, again, to be able to capture these different travel con uh, conditions, and that's where the strength of this cluster analysis comes from. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, the step five for model calibration, the first um, uh, sort of item that we, we did, similar to other teams, was the identification of the representative day for each cluster. Uh, and consistent with the 2019 methodology, uh, we selected the representative day based on the minimum deviation from centroid for the key performance measures. Keep in mind, this is not a synthetic date. This is an actual date, as other team members discussed. Um, and the table that you see here is showing the selected representative days for those clusters and also displaying their travel characteristics. So just a couple interesting observations here that I wanna uh, capture. So if you look at cluster number two, low demand cluster, that's happening on July 4th. Uh, you know, that makes sense, especially keep in mind we focused on the AM peak, um, you know, 6 AM to 9 AM, not PM peak. So again, you would expect pretty low volumes uh, on July 4th as well. A uh, couple other interesting observations. If you look into cluster number three, weather influence cluster, you can see the visibility is only 0.7 miles, uh, much lower than other clusters. Again, that that um, validates um, the cluster um, as, uh, with respect to the representative day. And similarly, crash influence cluster has the highest severity index, which was something we developed that sort of represents the, um, the, the, the presence of a cr uh, crash as well as how uh, severe the crash is. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to relatively go fast with these. We went through the same exercise in terms of model calibration, where for each cluster, we uh, developed the sigma bands using the one sigma band and two sigma bands, uh, bands or, or the variation envelopes. And the example that you see here is just from one of the clusters, which is uh, recurring congestion, but essentially we created these uh, variation envelopes for each cluster that was identified. Next slide. Um, so... Once sort of we um, identified our clusters and, and created the, the variation envelopes, we start to look into these different criteria that we uh, that other team members discussed. Again, I'm not going to go into the details, but just a little bit of how we calibrated the models. Uh, generally speaking, we didn't make changes to driving behavior and car following for a lot of the clusters, except for the, uh, the, the weather related cluster. And when we looked into the actual data with weather related cluster, we recognized that the free flow speeds on the corridor was much lower than the free flow speeds on, let's say, low demand cluster. So that was one change we did based on field data. Um, we also made some uh, headway adjustments in terms of car following behavior uh, using some of the suggestions that was provided in, 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 in highway capacity manual. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the last step was alternatives analysis. So for the Colorado DOT case study, um, we basically tested both geometric improvements as well as operational improvements. So for the operational improvements, we uh, established what we call as local ramp metering, pretty simple fixed metering rate type of ramp metering on um, some of our, our um, on-ramps, um, but also for two of the on-ramps that had um, relatively high 
um, on-ramp demand as well as relatively low um, acceleration lane, um, we um, you know um, made at least hypothetically in this proof of concept demonstration, we extended those acceleration la uh, lanes um, as you can see on this slide. Next slide, please. Um, we also went through the number of replications and uh, selected the, the minimum number of runs, which was nine. Uh, that came from the recurrent congestion and, and something we applied for um, when we were conducting the alternatives analysis. Next slide, please. And in the last step of our alternatives analysis, we performed hypothesis testing as well to compare the results obtained from the alternatives and to determine basically if the difference in performance measures are statistically significant. Uh, I think the results that you see on the table below are really important. Again, uh, highlighting some of the strengths of the 2019 methods, especially from a decision-making perspective, because if you look, you can see that alternative one in this case, which is what we are testing compared to an, a baseline scenario, if you will, uh, the ramp metering and extended acceleration lanes, they were able to reduce um, the freeway mainline delay by about 9% approximately, right? But when we uh, performed the statistical testing, uh, the results showed us that um, it was not, um, um, we, we basically, um, we couldn't um, accept the results or, or I guess um, the, the null hypothesis cannot be rejected because the differences in terms of the benefits were not as high and the standard deviation of some of those, those scenarios were relatively um, large um, that led to uh, the, 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 the conclusion or the outcome that the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. Um, so that's pretty much it from the Colorado case study. With that, I'll, I would like to turn it over uh, back to David. All right, thanks so much. Um, before going over the overall results here, just wanna make sure we capture the, or answer the Q&A uh, that's coming in since we've got five minutes left. Uh, one of our attendees asked if there were other clustering methods utilized other than k-means. So I wonder if our three uh, PIs could comment on that right now. Oh, David, uh, you actually told me to answer it. I just answered it. Sorry, I didn't yeah. see you know. But I, the answer is uh, yes, uh, we used also the GMM method and uh, the k-means combined with the principal component analysis. So two two more uh, variations of the cluster analysis in addition to the k-means. All right, uh, Paul, would you like to comment? Yeah, I would just note we did use the k-means process, and I think I maybe mentioned before that was implemented in a Python environment here. Um, but I will say, you know, for our data analysts that participated in this project, you know, they were able to search some online repositories here and um, noted that they had identified several kind of pre-made cluster algorithm programs that were out there in, in various uh, programming languages or statistical packages. So I think there are a lot to choose from for folks that are familiar with, with that. Uh, Barack, any comment from you? Yeah, I can chime in real quick as well. We did explore, so as I mentioned in my presentation, the inflection point for the elbow method for our case also wasn't too obvious. So we thought it would be interesting to look into different clustering methods. We did try heuristic-based methods uh, as part of a sensitivity analysis. Um, and there are different heuristic-based methods, of course. Uh, but basically what we found was, uh, generally speaking, they were pretty close to what the elbow methods uh, was, was telling us with respect to the, the, uh, the cluster size. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, so I'd invite you to uh, type any other uh, uh, technical questions or uh, uh, or other types of questions into the chat pod at this time so we could answer them over the next few minutes. So I'll just say, uh, uh, re regarding slide 42 here, uh, in conclusion, the research team found that applying the 2019 volume three method is uh, much more comfortable when continuous count stations are available at key network locations. It's not necessarily for those to be at all locations, but uh, it's uh, very beneficial for them to be available at key locations. Uh, in addition, as Paul mentioned, the cover-to-cover -cover reading of the volume three can be extremely helpful in understanding the key concepts and possibly demystifying any preconceived notions. And while it's true that the 2019 method brings increased level of, level of effort in terms of data collection, preparation, and analysis, that level of effort is likely to decrease over time as practitioners gain familiarity and experience with the method. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide here uh, summarizes other benefits, such as removing the guesswork from calibration, improved estimation of annual benefits, and explicitly showing that certain designs or strategy are beneficial 
uh, explicitly beneficial for certain operating conditions. And so can we get um, just a, a peek at James contact info on the final slide? And there uh, if other questions can uh, be directed to James, who is the uh, FHWA project manager, and uh, be happy to answer those related to either the traffic analysis toolbox or the volume three method, uh, any questions that come up after the webinar. So uh, yeah. we just got a question yeah. about what variables are used to define the clusters. Would uh, any of our PIs like to take that on? David, let me mention quickly here before um, let the panelists uh, answer that question. So. If, uh, if anyone's interested in learning more about the, the Volume 3 2019 method, we do have a, a one-day in-person workshop that we can provide as a training opportunity. So um, just contact me if you're interested in that. We've delivered a number uh, to the agencies in, in the last couple of years. So it definitely helps to um, kind of learn what, uh, all the intricacies of, of the method. Very good. Thank you. Well, I can maybe take a shot at the question about the variables here. Um, so some of them are are what we would think of as traditional. So uh, traffic volume, whether those are measurements of flow um, and, and then uh, speeds or travel times. Uh, so those might be available from, you know, site counting locations or from probe data that gives more of a space, you know, mean speed. Uh, those that are added in this method that may not be used in traditional methods would be things like weather conditions, uh, crash and incident records, um, uh, road work, and um, I don't know, I'll jump in here, others, if, if I'm forgetting any, I typically think of, of uh, six, you know, categories there, um, but, uh, but basically all those things, and, and, you know, sometimes some of them are you know, going to be universal. Again, the, the volume and the speeds or travel times. However, depending on the situation, there might be others that are, you know, more customized. Um, if a location is particularly prone to a type of accident, uh, maybe, you know, seasonal uh, weather conditions or, or something of that nature that you want to bring, I think if you want to bring in an additional category of data, um, that, that there'd be an opportunity to do that. Excellent. Paul? Th thank you, Paul, uh, so much for your concluding thought. Uh, does anyone else have any other thoughts before we wrap up? David? Uh, no, appreciate the, uh, the the nice technical questions there. So, and and thanks for this opportunity to uh, to present our um, our findings. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending today's webinar. Uh, I also want to thank our panelists, uh, David. Uh, James, uh, Barack, uh, and Paul, as well as Mohammed, for their discussion here today. As I mentioned in the beginning, a recording version of this webinar will be available on the NOCO website. On behalf of the National Operations Center of Excellence and our, pan our par pre excuse me, presenters, I want to thank you for joining us today, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Happy Halloween, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Happy Halloween. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.